it pains me to say that I'd have to leave our home state. But if things don't change, I'd like to keep our business. And if we want to keep our business, it won't survive here if the laws don't change. It's hard to articulate how divisive the alcohol debate was in our country. It is a system that is deliberately designed to limit the sale and distribution of, of alcohol in order to prevent the uh, feared social problems. So the people that are most hurt by the current system are two people, two entities, the consumers and then also the people that are producing and actually making the alcohol products. And they face a lot of times really burdensome paperwork regulations, and really high markups or state taxes that make their products more expensive for people, uh, limit their ability to sell directly to people. Most every law or regulation that looks archaic, that if say, they do what? is there because somebody wants it there for their economic interest. You can't underscore how much laws have changed. The laws on alcohol today are totally different than they were 40 years ago. And I predict 40 years from now, they're going to be different than they are today. Alcohol's got a history. We have two constitutional amendments on it. First was 18th Amendment, banning alcohol. That was a one-size-fits-all, says no alcohol. That was a failure, and as a result, after uh, several years of uh, lots of controversy, they uh, passed the 21st Amendment. An important part to remember about 21st Amendment is Section 2. Section 2 grants the right to the states to regulate alcohol. And as a result, we have 50 different state markets for alcohol, not a national market for alcohol. And as a result, you're going to have different laws in each, in each state, and, but that's by constitutional design. It's the only product in the Constitution that has its own constitutional amendment, a governor regulation of it. In 1933, when they repealed Prohibition, uh, John D. Rockefeller commissioned a study uh, to come up with some recommendations as to how the states and the federal government should uh, regulate uh, alcohol going forward uh, to try to avoid reversion to the Wild West saloon days that had preceded uh, the Prohibition era. You know, Rockefeller was one of the leading proponents of you know, Prohibition. He was a big funder of, of the groups that were pushing uh, to get rid of alcohol. But he, uh, in a very public letter in the New York Times, said, you know, I've pushed for Prohibition in 18th Amendment. I was wrong. We need to legalize it, but regulate it. And he didn't just stop there. He funded the study, a book called Toward Liquor Control, um, that was uh, published in 1933 um, at the behest of uh, John Rockefeller. And uh, that book kind of set up a lot of the model of that system that states then took and implemented and uh, ran with. And actually all, sta uh, all the states eventually adopted a version of that model. So they created a three-tier system, which basically uh, says you can't be both a, a manufacturer or wholesaler and a, and a retailer. So that uh, uh, is still in place in virtually everywhere in the country. The first tier is us. We make it. Second tier, the, you know, the wholesalers. They transport it. The third tier, the retailers. You know, it was designed to do two things. Prevent the return of the saloon and encourage temperance. The idea was we want to tamp down this industry to keep people from you know, getting drunk and raising hell. So, uh, it, it, it has done that fairly well. One of the difficulties with that is, is uh, whether that middle tier should be legally mandated or whether it should be something that uh, is more voluntary. In a voluntary open market, three-tier systems are just a natural part of the market. It, the distributors are very helpful in getting products to market. In a mandated three-tier system, it locks opportunity, it locks entrepreneurship out, it inconveniences consumers, I believe in the three-tier system if we were to use it on a, uh, on a market level. I don't think it should be mandated. If distributors are that needed, well, I'll go hire one. I don't want to buy a bunch of trucks, right? I don't want to go out and do the distribution myself and set up a distribution center. I don't want to do that. I like making it and I like getting it out so we can sell it in retail. I would use a distributor if I thought that I was getting a fair price for my FOB and they weren't trying to screw me. Wholesalers help you know, alleviate problems for a variety of issues. For example, taxation. 
many states make the wholesaler pay for it as a point of entry when it comes into the state before it can be sold at retail. Making sure the products are approved, making sure it's not uh, some product that's you know illegal or forbidden or, or illegally made. They can tax anybody in the business. It, it doesn't have to be through a wholesaler or whatever. If people are going to abuse alcohol, they're going to do it in either system. But what this system does is it prevents people who want to appreciate, who want the specialty products, people who want to innovate, and it just undermines the marketplace for that. Uh, I don't see any reason, safety reason, for the government to be involved. Tier two in Virginia is broken. We need to have the freedom of choice to use whatever distributor that we want and do our negotiations directly with them. Wholesale and retail of, of distilled spirits in Virginia is conducted by the Department of Alcoholic Beverage Control. So we only have basically two tiers. You got the manufacturer and you've got ABC. They limit our staging, they limit our commission, and they can arbitrarily pick what stores we're in and how much we can sell out of those stores. Uh, so it's not the three-tier system that, that's the problem for us. The problem for us is the fact that due to the control system, our guys uh, are unable to make sales directly uh, themselves to retail. A control state is where the government controls um, how it's sold, right? And, and a licensed state is where they license private parties to sell. So like New York licenses liquor stores to sell liquor only, but in Virginia, the government sells liquor. Um, and then in other states, the supermarkets can sell liquor, everybody can sell liquor. Uh, as to uh, the, the issues of the control states, um, you know, they provide a lot of revenue for the state and they provide a lot of access. I, I, I think there's a, uh, there's a lot of uh, folks that you could talk to that are small producers that love the control states and the larger producers may not like the control states because they lose shelf space to these unproven small guys versus the larger guys. The, the segment of the industry that has the most negative uh, impact from the, uh, the design of the system is the distillery industry. The, the distillers are still suffering from the 1933 idea that we should make it harder to get uh, distilled spirits and easier to get beer and wine. So their taxes are higher. They have fewer privileges. The number of, of outlets uh, for their products are smaller than, than beer and wine. So everything is, is stacked against them. Um, we knew how much we were going to have to pay when we distribute it to the headquarters, but we were not aware of the cut that they take um, out of the distillery tasting room. Wineries, breweries, cideries, they don't have to pay anything. We have to pay 54% of every bottle. And so that is very costly and it's very burdensome to us. There's not really a rational reason for things to be treated differently. The presumption is that spirits are more dangerous, um, but you can abuse any type of alcohol. And if somebody's gonna abuse it, they're gonna abuse it, right? Um, the reason we have all these laws, they started with the temperance movement. The reason really is to protect certain interests. So once these laws got into place, um, for instance, spirits are sold in some places in government stores. Well, the reason is because the government wants to make the money. It's not because it's a more dangerous product. The control state makes it harder, but if control states like Pennsylvania have been able to figure it out, you would think Virginia could figure it out. So within Pennsylvania, we're allowed to have five remote tasting rooms. And so we don't have to have full production facilities with those remote tasting rooms. We can just have a tasting room to provide experience for our customers. We can sell bottles, do cocktails, and educate them about our products and spread the word on, on Silverback. Um, they also were allowed to sell bottles at festivals. Um, we're allowed to give tastings at festivals. We're allowed to sell at farmer's market. Yes, we need some laws, but yes, let's make it profitable for the distilleries to come here. You know, agritourism is very big right now. People want to go on road trips and try the local beer, try the local, you know, distilled spirit. Um, and a lot of states have uh, really severe limits on that. You know, you might only be able to uh, try three ounces of a spirit while you're there. Uh, you might uh, only be able to buy one bottle of, uh, of booze while you're there. You can't buy any more than that. You know, the fact is alcohol is unique. Alcohol is an intoxicant. Alcohol uh, can be abused. According to the Centers for Disease Control, not, not me, Centers for Disease Control say 88,000 people a year die from alcohol. That's twice um, 
what the, the amount of deaths from opiates that, or, that everyone's talking about. So we can't lose sight of that. If you were a consumer and your main interest was this is uh, what I buy and this is how much it costs me and this is how many outlets I have to, to purchase it, then the, the alcohol regulations probably don't uh, do much good for you because they're designed to make alcohol more expensive uh, so that uh, to discourage people from excess c consumption. On the other hand, if you're a, a, a taxpayer who is either a non-consumer or a uh, moderate uh, occasional consumer, uh, it's probably been pretty good for you because uh, the system makes a lot of money. Uh, ABC transfers hundreds of millions of dollars to the general fund every year. If you didn't have those hundreds of millions of dollars coming from ABC, then they'd be looking for that money in income taxes or some other sort of uh, revenue streams. One third of Americans don't drink. Two thirds do, but even at that two thirds, there's only a few that drink regularly. Some just have a few. And uh, you know, often the alcohol debate's pushed by folks that are in the industry or, or you know, you know, drink more than the vast majority of, of, of voters. There's certainly a role for government to play. I don't, I don't think a lot of people are anxious to go back to the you know, uh, black market of moonshine, for example, where people could actually get hurt with uh, certain kinds of alcohol. Um, and it's just kind of what is the best, most rational system for the government to get involved. I love what we've created here. We have 14 international wards. For a craft distillery, that's unheard of. We work really hard. We work 12, 16, 18 hour days sometimes to produce a great product for customers and to keep up with the demand. I don't mind doing that. I love what I'm doing. I am passionate about it and I talk to everyone, but the fact that you have to give so much of your profits away, it just... It's uh, regulated, it doesn't move as fast maybe as other industries, but coming in with the bowl in a china shop approach isn't, uh, isn't good for a consumer, it's not good for public health, and good for the regulatory goals of the state. And we created a system and people made economic uh, assumptions and investments uh, based upon the system that was created. And as those investments have, have, have grown and be, you know, be, become a, a part of the system, there are people who uh, you know, don't want to see uh, pieces of it change. So it, everything goes back to money. It's not quality of product. It's not whether we're protecting the public welfare and health of the great state of Virginia. What it comes down to is beer, wine, and cider have a much easier time getting rid of their product to Virginians than I do, and their taxes are much less. That means that I am always swimming uphill in this, in this state. And you know, limiting people's ability to be able to directly sell products to consumers is a huge handicap on those businesses. That's how these craft distilleries actually market their products. They don't buy you know TV spots. They you know they're not uh, you know in the Super Bowl like Budweiser is. They're actually trying to get people to come and actually taste their products and want to buy more of their product. And the fact that we actually prevent them from doing that is just an incredible barrier uh, to them expanding in the marketplace that I don't think you really see in, in almost any other industry. A lot of critics say that somehow the system keeps out new entrants to the to marketplace, and uh, I, I, the facts just don't support that at all. The number of permits for distilleries, wineries, and breweries continues to skyrocket up. And specifically in the case of distilleries, in 2010 there was uh, roughly 500, and now in 2017 there's over 2,000. It's a four-fold increase in just seven years. Uh, there are new brewer, distil breweries and distilleries opening up every day and uh, bringing a lot of excitement to the category. There's a lot more exciting things happening and I think that's just really the American spirit. It's not any thanks to the regulations. Climate's incredible. Our water that we have here off of our property, the grains that Virginia farmers provide for us, the fact I think we got the best distiller in the world, right, with, with my wife and with my daughter. That's fantastic. I think, however, the business climate in Virginia is abysmal. You know, especially for distilleries, the regulatory burden is pretty onerous.